snow fell gently upon Liu Biao's village camp, tumbling straight down through the still air. Outside, Zhao Yun interpreted heaven's will. The winds have halted. The sky dares not draw breath in anticipation of this profound justice, he announced. Liu Biao, a scion of the Han himself, shares no joy with his uncle and spares no platitude for soulless warlords. I will ride out and bring proper accord to the Empire with a single thrust of my spear. With this, the attack began. Arrows were loosed into the village, where Liu Biao's soldiers were again among those struck down. Zhao Yun charged into a wall of troops, but by some mishap he was caught on a spear and dragged off his horse. The horse ran on, deep into Liu Biao's lines, not looking back. Enraged, Zhao Yun took up his spear and began to cut a path forwards on foot. Cheng Shu took it upon himself to bring the army along too. The defenders to the front were cut down in droves by tightly packed volleys of arrows, while the defenders to the rear were slain one by one by Zhao Yun. I purge you, rebel children, Zhao Yun called out. The Han is like a man waking up after sickness. You are like the sweat that must be drawn out and cast aside. Heaven's sacrosanct value is fealty, and most abhorred value is arrogance. Knowing that, who here deserves live a moment longer? You least of all, a voice responded. Approaching on foot, this man wore heavy armor and wielded a thin short sword. The wounded on the ground begged him to rescue them and spoke his name over and over, General Zhang Liao. Were you not appointed by the court to serve Gong Sun Zan? Yes, they call him the King of Yan now. Yet here you are killing peasants in service to their supposed champion. Why not stick yourself on that spear and rid the land of the very tumour that caused its ills to begin with? Not standing for such talk, Zhao Yun slashed and stabbed at Zhang Liao frantically. It was a fruitless effort. Zhang Liao turned the spearhead aside with his blade, leading it in a curling dance that easily matched Zhao Yun's aggressive pace. They fought for 50 bouts, by which time the rest of Zhao Yun's troops had arrived. Surrounded, Zhang Liao threw his sword to the ground and said, Anyone can claim to be serving a higher purpose, and anything can be made virtuous by a poet. But how we tread over the land is all that matters. That is rendered virtuous without a word being spoken. Zhang Liao said and did no more, but in turn no one acted against him. With a jerk of his head, Zhao Yun ordered the valiant general be led back to camp. Then Zhao Yun ran up to the front of the advancing formation and saw an array of tents set up in the center of the village. There were troops all around them, and outside the entrance to the largest sat an old man in a golden robe and bejeweled headpiece. Of course, it was Liu Biao himself. Zhao Yun waved his men to attack and joined in personally. While the soldiers from both sides brawled, Zhao Yun heard his name being called. It was coming from the tents, and after barging through to investigate, he saw Liu Biao seated inside his tent. A tea set was laid out in front of him. A soldier invited Zhao Yun, and the general obliged. The tent flap was tied closed, but the noise of battle all around became no quieter. Liu Biao motioned for Zhao Yun to sit, and he did so. Two maids poured out the tea and helped clean off Zhao Yun's bloody attire. General Zhao, I hope I am not disturbing you greatly, Liu Biao said. That is yet to be seen. I'll accept no gifts less sincere than your surrender, Lord Liu, Zhao Yun replied. It is hard to surrender with sincerity to one who offered no such privilege to my people, to this very village. Anyone can be loyal. If I need ask it of someone, that only proves they have already committed a crime. There were many so blindly loyal to the traitor Dong Zhuo. Were they not criminals? Dong Zhuo took his office by force. Liu Bei was begged to accept the responsibility on behalf of the Emperor and the people. There is no comparison. But did Emperor Dong Feng not take Emperor Shan into his own court, where the young boy saw that the land was still ailed by starvation, disease and government corruption, despite Liu Bei's clean-faced proclamations? There he saw that his realm was doomed and could not bear it. 
Only then, cowering in fear of the world Liu Bei is creating, did he try to escape it all and find some scrap of peace for himself. Were he older, perhaps it would be less egregious that Liu Bei dared exploit the Son of Heaven's misery. How can the Son of Heaven be forced into making a decision? He is the highest authority, the highest power. You disgrace him by claiming he was coerced, and reveal your own contempt for the one you claim to support! <laughs> Zhao Yun laughed. Liu Biao sighed and shook his head. You are too great a hero, General Zhao. You have forgotten what it is like to be weak. Emperor Shan chose to give up his throne only as much as my people chose to be born in my domain. What a curse greatness is! to take one so far from knowing what it means to be human. Now please, General, let this all end. I will go to the Emperor Dongfeng and settle this matter." Zhao Yun wasn't sure what Liu Biao was trying to say, but the allusion to surrendering was picked up at least. Liu Biao did surrender, although only to the court officials in Donghai, where he shared tears with Liu Xie in the newly fashioned Imperial Palace. Liu Bei was out of reach, having crossed the Yellow River to attack the city of Herdong. The area was under Zheng Jiang's control and offered access into her personal realm in the Bing Mountains. The city was put under siege for several weeks, during which time there was crucial action on going far away. After taking the head of Yuan Shao in Dong, Zhang Fei had been stalking the mountains in search of Yuan Shang, the late Yuan Patriarch's third son. This son had an army of his own, and had attacked Peng Cheng Commandery in search of revenge. While he took territory, he made no impact on the Empire's military situation. After cooling off, he tried to march back home, but Zheng Fei fell upon him just as he had Yuan Shao. Master Xu was right. This brat was so scared he really did try a night march, Huang Gai commented as the Yuan column marched up the road. When the time was right, the Liu troops lit lamps and sprung on the column from all around, killing foes by the hundred. Huang Gai managed to get into the action first and had his chance at Yuan Shang. This time, Zhang Fei allowed his comrade some acclaim and watched Huang Gai sweep a huge great axe into Yuan Shang's stomach. The Yuan forces scattered and the fighting was over in mere minutes. The Yuan clan's fortunes waned ever further. Their dreams of pride of place beside Emperor Shan vanquished like a candle flame in a storm. As the sun rose over the bloody road, another encounter began in the south. Near the city of Changsha, Shah Hudun had been searching for the Wu army said to be based nearby. Incredibly, he had ended up camping on one side of a hill while the Wu army was actually on the side opposite, but neither side came across the other. The Wu force, led by Sun Tzu's stout mother, Lady Wu, marched off towards Changsha, surely destined to let Xia Hudun go searching through the countryside in vain. However, Xia Hudun had recently been joined by one Liu Zong. He was a son of Liu Biao and had little interest or ability for campaigning. He was sent out to war all the same, and as a member of the royal house, was given a degree of independence that far exceeded his worth. Therefore, his presence on the Wu battlefront had achieved nothing at all, until now. He was trailing behind Xia Hudun during the march, making his own separate camp with his small retinue each night. This meant that when Lady Wu bypassed the main army, she ended up walking into Liu Song and his 700 bored soldiers. Thinking it was Xia Hudun, she took her time preparing a wide battle formation before advancing further. This gave time for Liu Tsong to get a rider to his general, and so just as Lady Wu began to march east, horns and drums sounded from the west. Xia Hudun raced his men to line up and show their full number, saving Liu Tsong by drawing the Wu army towards the more significant prey. Xia Hudun rode out ahead of the army to challenge for a duel, but in response, Lady Wu herself picked up a bow and fired a single arrow into the sky. It soared across the battlefield and fell on an unaware Xia Hudun from above, thudding into his helmet and drawing blood. Then the Wu army charged forwards. Xia Hudun just stood and waited, refusing to engage the foot soldiers as they thudded by. 
Behind him, Zhang Yong and Guo Jia directed the soldiers into battle. In front, Lady Wu finally sent someone out for a duel. It was a man named Gong Shu Hui, of whom Xia Dun had never heard. Expecting little after the introductions, he was taken by surprise when the general drew two fine swords with shimmering hilts and together parried and attacked at once. Shahu Dun was knocked into the mud and only just stumbled to his feet in time to receive a string of carefully coordinated blows. Indeed, Lady Wu chose her company well. Being a patron of martial arts and a keen practitioner herself, her retinue was filled with combat experts. This Gong Shu Hui overpowered Shahu Dun seemingly without effort and the latter turned to flee. He was only on foot but Lady Wu ordered that no pursuit be made, shaming Shahu Dun yet further. This display could have spelled doom for the Liu army, but at that moment, a line of horsemen galloped in from the east, shielding Shahu Dun from harm and striking deep into the rear of the Wu army. The front of the army had better fortunes, with Lady Wu and Gong Xu Hui cutting through line after line of troops, breaching the Liu formation right through the center. Zhang Yong fled from the deadly pair. Indeed, there was no one there who could match them, and all the Liu troops could do was run about in all directions like panicked fish. The fighting on the wings was more promising. Liu Song's arrival achieved the encirclement of the Wu army. The ends of the line were pinched, and whole companies were slaughtered from all sides. This turned the battle, and soon the Liu soldiers were consuming the smaller Wu force without relent. In fact, the killing was so complete that towards the end there was scarcely anyone other than Lady Wu and Gong Xu Hui still at large. Lady Wu ordered Gong Xu Hui to retreat and he obeyed. Wishing to make a point, she stayed behind and rode around the Liu troops for a while, before finally being completely surrounded and dragged into captivity. She was brought before Xiahu Dun once the army regrouped. The Emperor has pledged to exterminate the entire clans of the villainous kings, he said. What reason have I to let you live on after what you've done? I hope you won't, Lady Wu said. If you spared me after what I've done, it would make it seem as if I was wrong to fight you, and as if it will be wrong for my children, my family, to restore this empire to reason. Kill me according to military law, and I will spare you the curses on your name. Shahu Dun carried out the lady's request and his lord's order. Gong Xu Hui heard of this and arrived at Shahu Dun's camp a few days later to submit himself in the same manner. Shahu Dun complied, this time feeling a lot more satisfaction for it, and finally summoning the energies to report his victory to the empire. The news was carried beyond the empire also, into the northern realms, where one Yuan Tan received it particularly poorly. He eldest son of Yuan Shao, had inherited his clan's doomed enterprise. Now that the Kingdom of Wu had failed to make a dent in Emperor Dongfeng's power, what hope did the thrice-defeated Yuan have? When Han troops arrived in force at his seat in Hernei, his sense of duty to his late father and brother was finally broken. The remaining Yuan lands were joined to Liu Bei's empire, and Yuan Tan was spared the extermination of his clan as an example. He was able to meet with Liu Bei personally, who now sat in the court at Herdong. With business there concluded, Liu Bei moved quickly to cross a river to the north, but on the other side he was blocked by an enormous army camp. It was Gongsun Shu, son of King Gongsun Zan, with some 2,000 veteran troops. He had rushed to Herdong to strike Liu Bei, and his prey had now stumbled right into his lair. Liu Bei's army was still exhausted from taking the city. Zhuge Liang was quick to advise a retreat. Liu Bei returned across the river, and Gongsun Shu followed. There would have been time to unite with the city garrison and turn the tables, but an unusual occurrence intervened. There were three men on horses who were riding in front of Gongsun Shu's army. Scouts had presumed they were officers of some capacity, foolishly leading the vanguard all in person but it was rather a different story in reality. These three were Zhou Xin, Song Yang and Liu Wei Huang, lowly military officials in Liu Bei's own expansive administration. They were generals in service to Imperial Marquis Li Jianli Ting, 
and had been on the run from the Yan army ever since the Yijian army was crushed on the other side of the Bing Mountains. Their flight had led Gongsun Shu right to Liu Bei. When the three saw the Liu banners ahead, they finally ended their flight and turned around. So imposing was their sudden halt that the Yan army halted as well, fearing foul play. As a standoff went on, news of all this reached Liu Bei. Impossible! Such valour! We must advance and aid them, he said, but Zhuge Liang disagreed. If we commit the army to battle for the sake of those three mediocre talents, how will the men trust us in the future, even if we win, he argued. Prime Minister, if we let them die fighting instead of us, how then can the men trust us? Guan Yu pointed out. If our men at least live, they can learn to trust us despite any adversity, Zhuge Liang shot back. There is no debate to be had, Liu Bei insisted. What use does the Empire have for leaders who won't even protect their own? Assemble everyone at once! The Emperor's order had to be followed, and so the Liu army ran out to join the standoff. The wounded and the sick had to be mobilized to have any chance of matching Gongsun Chu's numbers. Guan Yu and Zhuge Liang both fell into this category. They had a severe lack of close quarters weaponry and shields, and so could only form a narrow front, half the size of the Yan formation. But they formed it all the same. Seeing that banners were streaming from the Liu camp, and that the Yan army was turning to face them, the three Yijian generals charged forwards to avenge their recent losses. Their view of the Liu army was obscured by a shallow ridge. Most likely they did not see how ill-prepared the relief force was for battle. Most of Liu Bei's able troops were crossbowmen and archers, so the best he could do to help was to shoot at the Yan army from a distance. This forced Gongsun Shu to attack the Liu troops, but it was too little too late. Zhou Xin and Liu Wei Huang had already perished in their mad charge. Now that the Yan army was attacking in force, the narrow, thin Liu line appeared quite inconsequential. Your Majesty, since the matter has been decided already, we should return to camp and await a more favorable match, Zhuge Liang advised. But Liu Bei had another idea. Only by standing up to the traitor king can we act in accordance with the people's Tao, he declared. Before Zhuge Liang could argue otherwise, Liu Bei took his brother out to the head of the army. Since brother Zhang is not here, and we are destined to die on the same day, we shall brave the enemy without worry, Guan Yu assured his liege. Together they parted the Yan advance, slowing it if not by force but by confusion. Seeing this, Zhuge Liang redoubled the barrage of bolts and arrows. In this way, the Yan force saw its advantage wither away before they knew it. Guan Yu cut down General Chen Kai on the left, while in the center, Liu Bei eventually turned and fled when Yang Gang began to get the upper hand. Even in defeat, the Emperor had inspired his men with unrivaled passion, and they fought madly to resist the Yan push. With incredible energy they overcame the great mass of soldiers falling down upon them, and turned the battle around to the point when the Yan troops could not flee fast enough from Liu's scrappy band. Amid the final minutes of the fighting, Song Yang, the survivor of the trio, appeared at the Yan rear, and charged again into the fray, causing such a cheerful roar from the Liu troops that the battle was over at once. A few horsemen chased Gongsun Shu and some survivors away, while Liu Bei rushed up and bowed before Song Yang. Your bravery is nothing short of incredible, General. The Empire stands today only because of your efforts, the Emperor said. Song Yang nodded in response, then fell dead from his horse. Upon inspection, he was covered in mortal wounds. It was only by some extreme spirit that he had lasted until that moment. Liu Bei had him venerated as a hero. And ever since then, people have said, even a rat would emerge from a crumbling mountain if it were only named Song Yang. Invigorated by the win, the Liu army pressed on and finished off Gongsun Shu's regrouping troops, with their leader being captured alive. He was placed before Liu Bei, who now had the responsibility to carry out his own orders of extermination. However, seeing the likeness of his childhood friend in the young man's face, he hesitated. At once, Zhuge Liang approached with a look of concern. What would the Emperor's decision be? Read on.